Notice with me Acts chapter 2 and verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And you know, it, be, it would be helpful to kind of go over a few things that the students have learned and go a little bit further, but tongues is a supernatural language given by the Holy Spirit, and it is not known to the person who is speaking. The Greek word for tongues, glossa, Glossa means languages, not necessarily the, the tongue in your mouth, but languages. It's interesting, the Greek word translated utterance, as the Spirit gave them utterance, that word, and I'll endeavor to pronounce it, is apophegomai, and it means to enunciate plainly, to speak clearly. That's what the word means. So it doesn't just mean jarbled gibberish. It's not DDD. But it's actual words that are spoken, an actual language. Amen? The Wiest translation says this. It's a, he was a Greek scholar. His translation says this. As the Spirit kept giving them ability to speak forth, not in words of everyday speech, but in words belonging to dignified and elevated discourse. See, they didn't just speak in another language, the Holy Spirit gave them the ability to speak in this language. He released that ability within them. And I like the way he says this. Wiest says, in a dignified and elevated discourse. Discourse means communication. See, many Christians, why is that important? Many Christians think that tongues is crude, vulgar, something that low people you know, ignorant people do that. No, that's not true. It is an elevated discourse. Tongues is a higher language than English, a higher language than Nepali or Hindi. It's a higher language than uh, your tribal dialect, not a lower discourse. It's a higher elevated way of speaking. You see, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 1, Though I speak with the tongues of men, well, that would be all of our known languages, and of angels, but have not love. You know, I'm just a bunch of noise. So that, that seems to say that we might be speaking in an angelic language when you speak in tongues. Well, if I'm speaking in an angelic language, that sounds like angels may be responding when I pray in tongues. You know, if you were speaking, if I was visiting some place and there's a bunch of people speaking all these different languages, but somebody was speaking in English, since I know English, my ears would perk up. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. What is the purpose of tongues? Is there a purpose to it? Well, first, you know this, tongues is the initial evidence that one has been baptized with the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, they were baptized with the Holy Spirit. Initial evidence means first proof, the first uh, sign verifying the fact that a person has been baptized with the Holy Spirit. Well, we read Acts 2, 4. Then also in Acts chapter 10, the Bible says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all those who heard the word. And they of the circumcision who accompanied Peter were astonished because that the gift of the Holy Spirit was also poured out on the Gentiles. How did they know? For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then in Acts chapter 19, Paul found certain disciples and he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit after you believed? And they said, we have not so much has heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. He said to them, into what were you baptized? They said, into John's baptism. He went on to tell them that John gave a baptism of repentance, leading people to Christ who had come. And when they heard this, they were baptized in water. That is to say, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. In verse 6, Acts chapter 19, verse 6. And when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke with tongues and began to prophesy. There are only five recorded instances in the book of Acts of people being baptized with the Holy Spirit. Only five. 
I didn't say it only happened five times. I said there's only five recorded instances in the Bible. Three out of the five cases, it clearly says they spoke with tongues. In the other two cases, it strongly infers they spoke with tongues. Hallelujah. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that the Samaritans had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had not fallen on any of them, only they had been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They had been baptized in water. And when they laid their hands on them, they received the Holy Spirit. Simon, who was a, a sorcerer, saw that through laying on of hands, a spirit was given. He offered them money saying, give me also this power that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the spirit. I don't believe he would offer them money for nothing to happen. I don't believe he would offer them money if, he laid hand, if they laid hands on people and nothing happened. Something definitely happened. I'm sure this happened. They began to speak with other tongues. All the church fathers and historians tell us the Samaritans spoke in tongues. Hallelujah. The other example is the apostle Paul. A man named Ananias came in and laid his hands on Paul. Saul of Tarsus saw a light, you know, shining brighter than the noonday sun as he traveled on the way to Damascus. Hallelujah. And, and Ananias said, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the way as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Doesn't say anything about him speaking in tongues, but we know the apostle Paul did speak in tongues because he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. And not only... And not only is speaking in tongues the initial evidence of the infilling of the Spirit, but it should be a continual reminder of his abiding presence in us. I said it should be a continual reminder of his abiding presence in us. What is the benefit of speaking in tongues? Notice this scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 2. For the one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men. But to God, for no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the spirit. When you are speaking in tongues, you're not speaking to other people. You're speaking to God. Amen. For no one understands him. Well, that would include the person speaking. When I was first baptized with the Holy Spirit, you see, I was raised Presbyterian, God's frozen people. But I attended a, a, a campus prayer meeting at the university and I was baptized with the Holy Spirit speaking in other tongues. And then, you know, I was attending a little home fellowship, you know, every week. And so we were praying and I began to pray in tongues. And there was a dear brother in my church who heard me. And so when I got through praying, he looked at me and he said, what did you say? And I said, I don't know. And he said, then why did you say it? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> but actually, he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men. He speaks to God. When you are speaking, when you are speaking to God, what is that? That's prayer. So we could, uh, we could call this your prayer language. I said, we could call this your prayer language. There are other kinds of tongues, which we're not going to talk about tonight, but this we could call your prayer language. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, when you speak in tongues, the devil will try to convince you that you are wasting your time. Has anybody ever experienced that? You begin to pray in tongues and thoughts seem to come against you like, what are you doing? You, you, come on, this is a waste of time. There's so much work to be done. You know, you, you could be out there winning the lost. Uh, you could be cleaning the church. You, know, you could be feeding the hungry. And, and isn't it interesting when you're watching television, the, never the devil never tells you you're wasting time. And it's funny when you're playing, you know, a PlayStation video games, carom board, the, never tell the devil never tells you you're wasting your time. But when you begin to speak in tongues, he's trying to stop you. Anytime the devil tries to stop you from doing something, that's a clue that you need to keep on doing it. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. And I think one reason the devil tries to stop us from speaking in tongues is he doesn't understand what you're saying either. And it bothers him. I said, he doesn't understand. It's an unknown tongue to him too. He doesn't know what you're saying either. And it bothers him. When I was first married, well, not when I first married, but when my wife and I first came to Nagaland, we came in February 1st, 1994. We'd only been here a few months and we were driving in a vehicle past a big rice uh, field, you know? And so you have to understand, I am not from the farm. I'm not from an agricultural background. I'm not, I'm not from the village. I'm from the town, the city. I don't know anything about farming. So I turned to my wife and I said, tell me something, how does rice grow? Does the rice, you know, the grains of rice, does that grow? at the top of this, there were these, you know, tall grain stalks, uh, green stalks coming out of the ground. Does, that, does the rice grow at the top like wheat, you know, it's there? Or is it down in the dirt in the bottom like a potato and you pull it up? And she just looked at me like I was an idiot and said, at the top. And I said, oh, okay. 
So then later, that same week, she invited all her family members to our house for Sunday afternoon lunch. And, you know, we're all eating in the big room. And they're all, her family, so they're all jabbering away, you know, aloshe, hey, 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 you know. If you don't speak some of it, you go, hey, they'll think you understand, hey, 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 you know. And so they're all just jabbering away, you know. It sounds like they're angry at each other, but they're actually just speaking in Sema, you know. So I'm just minding my own business, eating my lunch. They're all talking, jabbering. And suddenly, my wife stood up. And she said something, you know, in her Sema language. And then she pointed at me. So they're going on. So she points at me. And then she went on talking some more. And they all burst out in laughter. They were laughing so hard. I've never seen people laugh so hard. They were slapping their thighs. <laughs> Tears were rolling down their cheeks. She, she was telling them the story about me and the rice. That's what she's doing, you know. But I didn't know it. <laughs> I noticed everybody was looking at me. And I think that's how the devil feels when we speak in other tongues. He don't know what we're saying, but he feels like, hey, I think they're talking about me. I, th- I think they're talking about, I think they're making fun of me. Yeah, that's right. We are. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. You see, the devil is not all knowing. He's not omniscient like God. I think the devil learns some things just by listening to you talk. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, the other, uh, several years ago, my wife in our house, she has like a, her, a little room and that's her prayer room. You know, that's actually like the Holy of Holies. I'm not allowed to go in there. Anyway, she, she goes there every day and she's praying. And so one day I was going to go to the office, I think, or something. And I was standing outside that room and I could hear her praying inside. She doesn't know I'm standing there. And she said, oh, Lord, don't let my husband have a hard heart. Okay, that's interesting. (laughs) I think the devil, I'm not comparing myself to the devil, of course, but I think the devil, (laughs) I think the devil, I think he learned some things just by listening to you pray. Amen. The story goes, one Christian was walking down a dark alley and suddenly a, a, a Dakoiti fellow with a gun stepped out, pistol in his hand to rob him. And immediately the Christian began to pray, oh Lord, please don't let him Find the money I have hidden in my shoe. And the robber said, praise the Lord. Take your shoe off. (laughs) Hallelujah. You see, there are certain websites, you know, that are secured by encrypting the data. You know, especially when you do financial transactions or banking, you know, we're going to buy something online. Those things are, are, should be encrypted, right? So it'd be unwise, you know, to do financial transactions on an insecure website. And then again, there are some messaging platforms, which you probably use all the time, like WhatsApp or maybe Telegraph and, or is it Telegram, I think. And, and they, they use what's called end-to-end encryption, so that no one outside of the chat can read what is typed. And then sometimes, you know, governments don't like that sometimes, to be honest with you, because they also don't know exactly what's going on. And sometimes they're a little too curious and they want to they they eavesdrop on all these conversations. Well, what I'm telling you is God has given us a hack-proof way of communicating with him. I said God has given us a hack-proof way of communicating with him. And that's why sometimes when I'm in the presence of others, I'll pray in tongues because I don't always want everybody around me to hear what I'm telling the Lord. Oh, God, you know, I have a problem in this area. You know, I have a problem telling the truth, God. And other people are like listening. Amen. So you don't want to, you know, some things I don't want to just say out loud, everybody. Hallelujah. So we're speaking to a to the Lord in a language that he understands. Notice this scripture, 1 Corinthians 14, 14. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, 
but my mind is unfruitful. So praying in tongues is spiritual prayer. It's with your spirit, and it does not go through your mind. Your mind is uninvolved, you see. Some Christians struggle to speak in tongues because they're trying to analyze everything. They're overthinking. They're thinking too hard. You can tell, you know, before they say a little word like shandai, they're, they're like trying to figure out shun, 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 shandai. What does that mean? Dai shun, shandai. They're trying to untie my hyundai. And they're trying to figure it all out, you know. And, and, you know, and, and they're thinking too hard. That's why they, they struggle. Amen. You don't, need to, you, you, know, you, don't have to, you don't have to be Albert Einstein to speak in tongues. You just need to believe God. Hallelujah. It doesn't go through your head. Amen. And you see, praying with our understanding is often limited because our minds are limited. Amen? But here's a way that we can pray beyond the limitations of our mind. So that means even if you are a new believer or even if you don't know the Bible very well, and all of us need to know it better, here's a way you can pray effectively even if you just got saved today. Because you see, the Spirit of God is not going to enable you to speak in a language that contradicts God's Word. The Holy Spirit is the author of the Bible. Amen. So that means praying in tongues will always be in agreement with God's will. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So that means we can pray, you know, with our understanding. That would be like in English or, or Hindi or Nepali or whatever language you have. But then we can also say, now, Holy Spirit, help me. I'm going to continue praying about this in the spirit, and I trust you to give me utterance. I trust you to give me the words to speak in this. Hallelujah. Does that mean I should only pray in tongues? No. Look at this scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 15. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit but I will sing with my mind also. So that means we should do both. See, most Christians in the body of Christ today do the majority of their praying only with their understanding, right? Sometimes they go to church and they say a few words in tongues, but, but they do the majority of their praying with their understanding. So that means their prayers are not as effective as they could be because they're only utilizing one kind of prayer praying with your understanding, but they don't understand enough to pray effectively in every situation. And then again, some prayers are selfish prayers. Yeah, amen, you know. We, we, so pray for me, I'm thinking about, you know, uh, uh, going to this town and working there, and you don't want him to go, so you say, now Lord, you know that there's so many people who are out of your will and, and there's so many people who step out of God's plan and, you know, the enemy will strike them and, and attack them. And I don't want that to happen to my brother. Well, actually, you're praying that way because you don't want him to go. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But when you pray in your heavenly language, it won't be a selfish prayer because it's given by the Spirit of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Some spiritual Christians don't pray enough with their understanding. They only pray in tongues. And so I think what happens is because it doesn't involve the mind, your mind gets distracted and bored. And you can become bored with your prayer life. So you need to do both. Not one or the other, but both. Now, can I pray in tongues whenever I want to? Yes. Let's go back to verse 15 again. What am I to do? He said earlier, if I pray an unknown tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I going to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. So notice, I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Paul uses this expression, these two words, I will, four times in verse 15. I will, I will, I will, I will. A spirit baptized believer can speak in tongues when he wants to. Hallelujah. I will pray with my spirit. That would be in tongues. But I will pray with my mind also. That would be in your known language. In fact, he went on to say that we can even sing praise with our spirit. That means in tongues. I don't think we do that enough. We can praise God. We can worship God in our heavenly language. In fact, he went on later to say, if you bless in the spirit, 
The other person can't say amen to your giving of thanks. You can give thanks in tongues. You know, when you're by yourself, here comes your lunch, your dinner or something like that. I don't, you guys don't eat by yourself, but maybe you do. I do. Anyways, I can pray in tongues over my meal. I can bless, you know, I can bless people in tongues. Hallelujah. The only thing is that doesn't edify the other person, but he said, you give thanks well. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So the point is every spirit baptized believer can speak in tongues when he wants to. That means you don't have to get worked up to speak in tongues. You don't have to get hot and sweaty. You don't have to, you know, you know, run around the church five times, you know, and then sing three songs and clap real fast. And you, you don't have to do that to speak in tongues. You can speak in tongues in cold blood. I mean, do you have to get worked up to pray in English? What, what if, you know, what if after this meeting was over, the students go outside in the dining area and maybe one of the RAs, a Brother Ibomcha or somebody like that, says, okay, we're going to call on uh, Brother Zama Zama to pray over our dinner before we eat. And Brother Zama Zama says, all of you stretch your hand toward me and believe God for supernatural utterance that I may pray over the dinner. And then he begins to sing a song. Oh, 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 oh you know. <laughs> well, Brother Bumcha would say, Brother Zama Zama, please sit down. We're very hungry. We'll call on Sister Doohickey instead, not you. Hallelujah. Because you, you don't have to do that. Hallelujah. See, some people think you only can speak in tongues during some revival service, some huba, some revival, some special. No, you can, you can every day. I will. He, notice he didn't say, I feel. He said, I will. As an act of your will. He gave them the ability to express themselves in a heavenly language. Hallelujah. Notice this scripture. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2. We read it earlier. He speaks not unto men, but unto God, for no man understands him. But he utters mysteries in the spirit. But he utters mysteries in the spirit. The Amplified Bible says this. He utters secret truths and hidden things not obvious to the understanding. What am I doing? I'm speaking mysteries. Now, what does that mean? On the one hand, I don't know what I'm saying. So for me, it's a mystery. That's true. But I think there's another thought. See, Paul, who wrote this verse by the Spirit, Paul uses the word mystery to describe God's plan of redemption. In the same book, 1 Corinthians, back in chapter 2, chapter 3, he, he uses the word mystery, the mystery that was hidden in God before the ages. You know, he's talking about how God planned to save mankind, how Jesus would come and die for us all things. And it was, the, it was this hidden wisdom of God. Amen? Well, see, God also has a plan for your life. Not just the body of Christ, he has a plan for you. What is God's will for your life? Well, you may know some things, but other things are a mystery. Where will you be a year from now? Well, you may think you know, but honestly you don't. For you, it's a mystery. But see, most people pray backwards. God wants you to pray forwards. See, most people, when there's a problem, there's a need, then they ask God to fix the problem or supply the need. But you don't have to just pray backwards, that's fine. You can pray forward, you can anticipate the problem, you can anticipate the need, and so that when it comes, you're already prepared to step into it. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So you can process the plan of God for your life in prayer, especially praying in other tongues. That's why I would especially encourage the students, everyone for that matter, or especially the young people, but the students, too, really spend time praying in your prayer language because you're not just talking. You are processing the purposes of God for your life. A friend of mine, when he was in Bible school, he got a job working in a go-down warehouse, and it was like an all-night job. 
and it was kind of not much to do, you know, a few forms to fill out, maybe a few lights to turn on and off. That's about it. So most of the time he's just sitting there, nothing to do. He's like a watchman, you know. And so he, he prayed a little bit, you know, and in English, but, you know, he ran out of things to say. So he began praying in, in the spirit and he felt a real unction, like a, it, was a, it was strong in him that he should do this. And so he spent hours, hours, day after day, praying in the spirit, just walking around this empty uh, warehouse, go down. And one day, this was like many weeks later, he said, Lord, I feel like I'm, I'm praying about something. I'm not just praying, I'm praying about something. What am I praying about? And he heard inside him the Holy Spirit say, your future. And when he graduated from Bible school, doors opened up for him and he just walked right in them. See, the thing is, you're trying to formulate your own plan. You've got your own idea about it. And you're saying, God bless my plan. But God already has a plan for your life. And he doesn't need your plan because his plan is already blessed. What you need to do is you need to process that by praying in the spirit, praying out mysteries. Then again, you can pray for loved ones that you have no contact with. There are, there are people in your life, family members, friends, others, acquaintances, who need your prayers. But you may not even be aware of what's going on in their life right now. Well, here's one way you can pray for others. The Spirit of God will put it on your heart or, or will lead you. Or when you're praying in tongues, you may be praying for the needs of others. You may be interceding for those you don't even know what's going on in their life. So I read this story. There was a young woman who was a missionary to Africa many years ago. I think this was maybe in the 1930s. She was a missionary to Africa. And then uh, she was ministering with, with a certain people there. And she, uh, she con con contracted some kind of a disease and got a high fever. And she got worse and worse. And she actually died. And so the, the, the villagers wrapped up her body and they put it in one, you know, house, uh, you know, thatch house, and they were preparing to bury her. They were getting ready for the funeral. Meanwhile, back in America, her father woke up that morning and her father was a farmer. And so he has to wake up real early to feed, you know, the chickens and to feed the pigs and milk the cows and all those things. But he had a strong sense in his heart, something's wrong. Something, something arrested his attention, a heavy burden to pray. And he was a spirit-filled believer. He knelt down, you know, uh, by the kitchen table and began to pray. And then he began to pray in other tongues. And the Spirit of God, you know, takes hold together with us against the weight of that burden. He helps us in our weakness, for we know not how to pray as we ought. Hallelujah. But the Spirit of God intercedes for the saints, you know, with groanings too deep for words that cannot be uttered in our normal articulate speech. And he began praying, even groaning in the Spirit. And one hour passed. Two hours passed, three hours passed, the chickens saying, we haven't been fed, the pigs are restless, you know, the, the cows are, are upset, you know, and he's, on, he's lying on the, on the kitchen floor, prostrate, on the kitchen floor, and, and praying in other tongues, just weeping and praying, four hours, I think it was five hours, something like that, and suddenly... He had a breakthrough. He had a release in his spirit. Don't give up until you, you get that sense of release, you know, to get that, that sense of joy, that sense of, you know, he knew in his heart, that's it. And he got up. Well, he didn't know it, but at the same time, as they were getting ready to dig the hole or getting ready for the preparations, suddenly that young lady in that thatch house got up and she was alive. And she walked outside that thatch house and um, they had revival. And... Uh, <laughs> Hallelujah. She came back to America. She told her story in the church and, when she, and told it to her family. And when they compared notes, the, the, day, the time she died was exactly the same time that the, the Spirit of God was moving on her father to pray. I think things don't happen the way they should in our lives because we don't pay attention. We're too busy. We don't pay attention to that something inside of us that's telling us you need to pray. And then when things go wrong, you know, we're ready to get angry at God or, you know, get offended and never go back to the church. But, you know, it's because we, did, we, didn't, we didn't utilize the tools God has given us. If God, this is a wonderful gift and it's a wonderful, powerful tool. But if God gives you a tool, he expects you to use it. And if you don't use it, it's your fault, not his. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 4. The New King James Version says, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. The word edify means to build a structure. Think of the English word edifice, which is like a big building, a big structure. And this same word could be translated charged up. Charge up. 
like you charge up a battery. How many of you here this evening have a cell phone? That's, that's a good portion of you. How many of you are diligent to charge up your cell phone every day? Huh? How many of you, you know, you know, at night you have your cell phone by the bed and you have it charged up? Or during the day, there's a certain place where you have that cell phone charging up. Because, you know, the terrible thing is when you're out in the middle, out in the middle of the town and you got to call someone or you got to send a message and you see that little battery icon. And it says like 1%. And it's red, that little red light. And it starts flashing at you. That's a bad feel. That's a terrible feeling, isn't it? Especially when you really need to call somebody. I'm in trouble here. I got a flat tire. I've got a punctured tire. And I've been in an accident. There's some rough looking characters. And I got to call somebody. And I see that battery sign. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Oh, Lord, can, can I borrow your phone? Oh, no, 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 no. In fact, if your battery goes dead, you can't do anything with that phone. It's just a piece of plastic. I think there's many Christians. Oh, 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 am I talking to somebody today? There are many Christians. The, the little battery icon and their spirit is flashing. One percent, one percent, one percent. Come on, we see some Christians show up for church on Sunday morning and they walk in the door in slow motion. <laughs> slow motion. You know, like molasses in winter, just slow, like a glacier from, from the Arctic poles. You know, they say, let's all stand up and, you know, like they have total arthritis. Mm. <laughs> Are you ready to praise God? <laughs> right? Real slow. Let's lift our hands. Uh, like, like, you know, a thousand kilos are on those hands. <laughs> and then when it's time for the offering, double slow. Like, you know, oh, you know, I, 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 my, you know my fingers are not working. They're slow. And when they're, when they're drained, when people are not spiritually built up, they start getting discouraged. Start getting very negative. They, everything they see is negative. It's too hot in here. It's too cold in here. The seat's not comfortable. The sermon's too long. The music's too short. The lights are too bright. The person beside me is coughing. I smell something too. I don't know. You know, the, oh. <laughs> everything negative, complaining, complaining, complaining. When I see church members who are complainers, I know they haven't been praying in tongues enough. And then when we are not edified, we get easily offended. Very touchy. You just make some little innocent comment and they take it very personally. He's talking about me, isn't he? <laughs> very touchy. Very, very touchy. Let's all shake hands with one another. And you get up to shake hands and no one shakes hand with you. And you... <laughs> very touchy, very touchy. But when you, when you, when you build up, Build up your spiritual battery. You're charging yourself up. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, it puts life in you. It strengthens you. It releases life in you. Hallelujah. You become more cheerful. You become more resilient. Someone can just spit in your face and you go, glory to God. It doesn't bother you. You, you just bounce, you bounce back easier from disappointments. Hallelujah. You get, you get a bad report. You know, hey, you're, you know, uh, you know, you, someone stole your car. Your house is on fire. Your mother-in-law is going to move in with you. Glory to God. It's okay. You know, you can just bounce back quickly because you're built up, you're charged up. I think a lot of times people don't realize the devil wants you to be run down. Because when you are depleted, you are easily defeated. He wants you to get run. And how he does it is by distracting you. Oh, don't bother praying. Hey, 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 over here, let's play carom board. Hey, 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 over here, over here, you know, let's just read this, you know, nonsense stuff. Let's just look at this foolish stuff. And like, you know, and you just day after day, hey, hey, let's not go to church today. I think I, it might rain today. Yeah, yeah. I think I read somewhere it might rain today. Let's stay home. Amen. I saw a cloud in the sky about the size of a man's hand. Let's just stay home today. Then they get run down. And then the devil says, boom, take that. And they fall apart. Well, in other words, if you will spend more time praying in the spirit, you won't have as much trouble with the devil. He won't be messing with you because he realizes this is not an easy case. 
Amen. Hallelujah. The Amplified Bible says this. He improves himself. He improves himself. Speaking in tongues is not harmful. It's good for you. See, some people, you know, in the church world, they'll say, okay, speak in tongues, that's fine, but, but be careful. Hey, be careful. Just, okay, a little bit of DD is okay, but, but, but be careful. Just a couple of shandais is okay, but be careful. <laughs> be very careful. No, don't do that too much. You may lose your mind. I know someone up on Mount Saramati, you know, they lost, no, don't, don't be very careful. It's not bad for you. It improves you. It doesn't, doesn't make you a worse person. It doesn't make you a worse husband or a worse wife. It makes you a better one. Amen. Amen. So that means if you want your marriage to improve, here's one way. It's not the only way, but here's a good way. Spend more time praying in the spirit. Maybe, maybe if you'd spend more time praying in the spirit, you'd spend less time nagging your husband. Because <laughs> the Spirit of God can speak to that man. The Spirit of God can deal with that man. The Spirit of God can guide that man. And by the way, while I'm at it, write this down in your notebook, sister. You're not the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Come on, men. I need some friends here. I don't, I don't see a lot of smiles out there. I, thank, thank you, men. Thank you, men. But then husbands should pray for their wives in the Spirit. You know, you want your marriage to improve, then you need to pray in the spirit more. Prove your, improve yourself. Hallelujah. Amen. Speaking in tongues is a spiritual exercise. As you can tell, as you see me today, I do not particularly enjoy going to the gym. I know it's hard to believe, but it's true. And I find it strenuous, rather unpleasant. My wife, you know, has to always finagle me and, and, and trick me into going to the gym, you know, and, and things like that she, because she loves me and she wants me to live a long time and she doesn't want me to look like, you know, a giant Zeppelin. So she's always <laughs> telling me, you know, well, let's go to the gym. We have to go to the gym, you know, and, and I don't really like it. I can't, I look at, as, I, as I'm on the treadmill, I'm, look, I'm counting the minutes exactly, exactly. As soon as, it, as soon as it's like done, ha, I'm done. I'm out of there. I don't even wait, you know. But it hurts a little bit, but no pain, no gain. It, it makes you stronger. Don't you wish that you could just buy one of those bodybuilding magazines and instantly look like the guy on the cover? <laughs> Buff. I wish. I mean, we can't say, uh, Pastor, pray for me that I'll look buff. <laughs> I'll lay hands on you. <laughs> it doesn't... It doesn't work that way. You got to work it out. You got to work out. Hallelujah. Amen. So when you work out in the gym, it keeps you stronger. It keeps you lean and mean. And when you pray in the spirit, it keeps you spiritually fit. Spiritually fit. Come on. Some people are kind of flabby. Their spiritual muscles are all flabby. Spiritually speaking, when they wave bye-bye, there's a double wave, you know, here and then here, double wave. <laughs> Flabby. <laughs> I mean, I know we're going to get older and things like that. And, you know, when you're 50, you're not going to have the same body as a 30-year-old maybe. But, but on the other hand, you know, you got to take care of yourself physically. How about spiritually? Come on, some people, oh, tell you what, some people do go to church and thank God for that. And they're hearing the word of God. They're feeding on the word of God, but they're spiritually constipated. Because <laughs> they're always eating and nothing ever comes out of them. Just... I know that's not a pleasant thing to talk about in church, but there's an analogy here that's unavoidable. And you know, when people are constipated, they're not so happy. <clears throat> mm. I haven't gone to the bathroom in three years. Mm. <laughs> Spiritually, some people are eating and eating, and eat, but they never, nothing ever comes out because they're, they're not acting on the word of God. They're not doing what the word of God says. And the, one of the problems is they don't say spiritually fit. 
Amen. Notice it says he edifies himself. It doesn't even say God edifies him. It says he edifies himself. So the more you speak in tongues, the more you will be built up. And because you don't speak with tongues with your mind, your mind will wander. Your thoughts will go here and there. And it's sometimes difficult to kind of bring your thoughts, you know, to discipline your thoughts. Amen. So not long after I was baptized with the Holy Spirit, I determined one day, one night, I'm going to pray in tongues for one hour. Yeah, I'm going to pray in tongues for one hour. And I went to a church that had like a big prayer room and it was open 24-7. So I went there and I knelt down and I began to pray in tongues. And I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. And I figured it's probably close to an hour now. I looked at my watch, two minutes. <laughs> Lord have mercy. So I, I doubled down and I prayed, I prayed in tongues. I prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. And I said, now it may be even over an hour. Four minutes. Man, it was hard. It was, it, was like, it was like difficult. But you know, when I finally broke through that one hour barrier, it seemed like it was a whole lot easier the next time. Hallelujah. Speaking in tongues will expand you. It will enlarge you spiritually. Hallelujah. See, like, you have a dream to do this, that God would use me. But the thing is, you're not yet in that place of fitness to be fruitful, useful. It's like saying, I, I want to go to the Olympics, but I don't want to work out. No, it doesn't work that way. Amen. Speaking in tongues is the gateway to the supernatural. The more you spend time speaking in tongues, it will take you into a supernatural lifestyle. Where you see, all I can tell you is this, very simply, the more I pray in tongues, the more I see coincidences in my life. And the less I pray in tongues, the less I see of those coincidences. It's actually not a coincidence, it's the grace of God. Hallelujah. Speaking in tongues will make your spirit more sensitive to the things of God. Speaking in tongues will make your spirit more sensitive to the things of God. Hallelujah. If you let yourself go and you just kind of don't care anymore and you don't really spend the time praying, especially praying in other tongues, then God could be speaking to you through a giant thousand watt PA system and you still don't hear it. Come on, some people, God could hit them in the head with a cricket bat and they would go, what? Because they're so dull. They're dull. The world will dull you. Some people will dull you. Amen? So how do I stay sharp? Well, spend time praying. Of course, read the word of God. Pray with your understanding. Worship God. But here's another very important thing, tool. Spend time praying in your prayer language. Hallelujah. Praying in tongues will help you to stay full of the Spirit. See, we need to be continually filled with the Spirit. See, some people say, well, I, I'm spirit full. I'm spirit filled. Back in 1997, I was filled with the spirit. Yeah, you were filled in 1997, but you've been leaking ever since that. <laughs> you need to be continually filled and filled again. This should be a daily thing with us. Hallelujah. When you pray in tongues, your spirit is commingling with the Holy Spirit. When you pray in tongues, your spirit is commingling and interacting with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is full of all the wisdom and the grace and the strength of God. Everything you need is in him. He's in you, but it doesn't automatically transfer to you. If that was the case, and as you get born again, boom, you've got all wisdom, all knowledge, all strength, but you don't. But as you pray in the Spirit, your spirit is commingling with the Holy Spirit. And things are being transferred from him into you. Hallelujah. Brother Kenneth Hagin said this, every significant breakthrough in my life, including in the area of finances, was preceded by a protracted period of praying in other tongues. Let me say that again. It's a long sentence. Every significant breakthrough in my life, including in the area of finances, was preceded by a protracted period 
of praying in other tongues, every breakthrough. So even financial breakthrough, you know, my, my finances are, I just don't have the resources I should have. I, I can't pay my bills, but a breakthrough came in my life and it happened after I spent time, serious time praying in the spirit. Every significant breakthrough in my life was preceded by a protracted period of praying in other tongues. Hallelujah. That's, that's something to consider. I think one problem is this, now, some of you, it's not, such, it's not necessarily so, but for many of you it is. You're not praying in the Spirit enough. Just very simply. You're Spirit-filled Christians, but you hardly ever pray in the Spirit. Amen? Every major breakthrough, first there was a long period of praying in other tongues. Hallelujah. Jude, verse 20. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, and praying in the Holy Spirit, he goes on to say, keep yourselves in the love of God. We could say it this way, building yourselves up on your most holy faith by praying in the Holy Spirit. I think we could say it that way. <clears throat> the Amplified Bible says this, make progress, rise like an edifice, higher and higher by praying. Make faith the foundation of your life, one translation says, and build on that by praying in the Spirit. Praying in other tongues will not give you faith, but it will stimulate your faith. It will stimulate your faith for a couple of reasons. One reason is because when you pray in tongues, that is an audible miracle that's taking place. And that stimulates your faith. That stirs up your faith. Secondly, when you pray in tongues, you are edifying yourself. Well, you're not edifying your body and you're not edifying your mind. You're strengthening your inward man. And the Bible says in Romans 10, 10, for with the heart, a man believes. So whatever strengthens your heart will strengthen your faith. Hallelujah. Amen. So in other words, some people, you know, they have a lot of Bible knowledge and, and thank God for that. But they need to spend more time praying in the spirit to strengthen their inward man so that they have the capacity to take hold of the promise of God in faith. Hallelujah. So Reverend Paul Young E. Cho Pastor, he went home to be with the Lord. Pastor, one of the, the largest church in the world. And he said that there was a woman in his church that was blind, totally blind. Both eyes, she was, I think she was born that way, stone cold blind. And so he said that as he was preaching, he would say things like, Jesus wants to heal you. But in his mind, he looked at that woman and said, but not you. And then he said, you know, today you can receive your healing. But in his mind, he looked at that woman and thought, but not you. He had no faith that she would be healed at all. Well, he had like this prayer mountain, this place where people in his church go to pray. And so this woman in his church went there to pray and she was baptized with the Holy Spirit, began speaking in other tongues. And she began praying in the Spirit. And Jude says that you're building yourself up on your most holy faith. And she began praying in the Holy Spirit and suddenly her eyes were opened. Wow. Completely, completely healed. And so she went to his uh, pastor, Paul Young Cho's office and said, I'm healed. And he said, yes, sister, in the millennium, you will be healed. No, she says, I'm healed now. He said, he said, I know when you get to heaven, you'll be healed. No, no, pastor, I'm healed now. He said, no, no, I don't believe it. He said, how many fingers am I holding up? She said, one, two, three. Where's my nose? Touch it. He, he ran around the room and she was chasing him. And he said, it's so. It's so. Whoa. Now, her husband had left her. She was married, but he had left her like some years ago. And so she said to the pastor, now I'm going to believe God my husband will come back. And Pastor Paul Young E. Cho said, in Korea, if the man leaves, he will never come back. In Korea, that will never happen. But I didn't want to, you know, try to hinder her faith. So I said, okay, sister. And she went back to that mountain and she began praying in the spirit. She just continued praying in the spirit. She's building up her faith. She's charging up her inward man and with the heart. It's easier to believe when you're built up. It's easier for faith to work when you're strong on the inside. Amen. And so she was at her little house in a Seoul in South Korea. And this ugly man came to the front door. Ugly. He was so ugly. He was just like, um, where is he? Anyways, <laughs> never mind. Really ugly guy. <laughs> I'm just teasing. And when he saw the woman, he said, oh. Now, it happened several years ago. He left her. He said, oh, do you live here? She said, yes, I do. 
Oh, you look exactly like my former wife. She said, really? Did your ex-wife used to live here? Yes, he, she lived here. Oh, and she looks like me. You could be sisters. You could be sisters. Of course, you know, over a few years, people, their appearance looks different, you know. I met someone even this morning I haven't met in many years, and I'm still not sure if that's the person I think it was. I'm not sure if they actually know me either, because we both look different. Anyways, so <laughs> he said, yeah, my, my, my wife lived here, and you, look, you could be her sister, but, uh, but, but you're not her. Oh, because my wife is blind. Oh, your wife lived here, but she was blind. Yes. And then he, she, she grabbed him with both arms and said, it's me. <laughs> And he said, oh, really? And, and he got born again. He got baptized in the Holy Spirit. They both go into church and went on serving God. Hallelujah. And God restored it. But she prayed in the spirit. Come on, she has more gumption. I like that story. Some people don't have any gumption, no determination. Well, I'm disappointed. So I'm not going to go to church for the next 25 years. Come on. Got to have some determination. <laughs> 